Hello everyone and greetings to everyone from SOAS, from London. I'm Bhavna Dave. Uh, I'm the postgraduate tutor in the politics department and I teach in the department. My area of specialization is politics of Central Asia and the Caucasus. And I teach two postgraduate modules, uh, geopolitics of the region and state and society in the region. Uh, and also work on China, Central Asia, Russia relations, geopolitics, and issues of migration. I'm happy to talk about, about politics department and especially how we teach and what our approach uh, is uh, to the discipline and also talk about what is it that makes uh, SOAS a very distinct place? What is our niche? After I've given a brief introduction to the master's program, I will I will uh, introduce my two colleagues here who will be uh, giving you a taste of what uh, it is like to study at SOAS. So they will be talking on this theme about politics during the pandemic. Uh, so let me just introduce them. Uh, Felix Berenskjöter. Felix, uh, yeah, I guess people can see you, who is the head of the department and he works on uh, his specialization is in uh, theory of uh, world politics, international relations with focus on issues of identity, security, power, the concepts of friendship and strangeness. And he has written about friendship and estrangement in IR in transatlantic relations. Then we have uh, Hagar Kotev who teaches political theory political thought uh, with focus on feminist theory, gender studies, post-colonial theory, liberalism and its critics and its uh, uh, critics. And her empirical work has centered on Israel, Palestine on issues of mobility, immobility in the history of political thought. Uh, let me just begin talk in the next minutes about what is so distinctive about studying at SOAS. There are lots of places you can go to study politics and international relations. So what is our niche? Two things. First, our focus is global. So we look at the world specifically through the lens of Asia and Africa, but at the same time, we don't lose sight of global issues. And uh, we put the regions in, in the broad context of global politics. So by no means is the focus only on Asia and Africa. Second, we look at politics through non-Western lens. So we teach uh, bearing in mind that much of the existing knowledge, theories, concepts have originated in the West. We teach about how these ideas, ideologies, institutions, practices, which emanated in Europe, but they spread across the world how they are being challenged, how they are being critiqued, how they are being interrogated, and, and what are the new forms of knowledge and new forms of thinking about these issues uh, that are being produced. So in that sense, the approach at SOAS is, is critical, which means questioning the existing concepts, theories, knowledge, and not taking anything for granted or anything as given or anything as this is how it should be. All the, uh, next slide, yeah. All the uh, members in the Department of Politics and mm. International Studies display a unique mix of disciplinary uh, grounding, regional knowledge, and the relevant linguistic skills, field-based, uh, fieldwork-based research, which is also fused with disciplinary knowledge, uh, is uh, something that's our specialization. So everyone that who is teaching here has had years of experience learning the language culture of a particular region and, and, and uh, talking from the perspective of that region. And even the colleagues who don't specialize in a particular region, they are also who specialize in concepts and theories. They are also able to talk and apply these to specific regions. The modules that we teach in this sense are a unique mix of our own personal insights from immersive field research as well as disciplinary grounding and knowledge of the region. 
you can browse the website and look at the whole broad range of uh, modules we teach. And many of these modules are the ones which uh, have a specific kind of a so as identity uh, on it. So you won't be able to study um, in the similar way with the similar approach elsewhere. I would just talk about very briefly uh, uh, the, the different uh, MSc programs that we have, uh, MSc International Politics, you see the list here. So MSc International Politics, it's, it again reflects a distinctive SOAS, SOAS approach to study of international politics, to whole range of questions such as why do wars happen? Is global peace possible? How is power exercised in international politics? What are the conditions for cooperation among states? How does migration challenge um, and change the international political order? We also look at these uh, theories and, and debate them by also incorporating issues, questions about colonialism, imperialism, race, gender, and, and class. And the focus tends to be global. And at the same time, it also sheds light on, it also illuminates uh, areas which are considered very marginal and remote. The second is the MSc program in politics uh, of conflict, rights, and justice, which uh, focuses on politics of human rights, on humanitarianism, international uh, and transition, transitional justice, especially in, in, po uh, post, uh, in conflict and post-conflict uh, areas. We also have uh, members of staff who are not only uh, specializing in terms of research, but who are also actively engaged in, in these conflict areas and, and are also contributing to policy making, to peace building and various other works and engage with variety of non-academic actors, non-state uh, uh, actors, NGOs and others. So this particular uh, specialization is highly relevant to anyone who is intending uh, to work in international NGO, international organizations, think tanks, advocacy groups uh, in areas of rights and humanitarian assistance, transitional justice. The next is MSc in political thought, which uh, is not just the study of political theory, but it's also uh, from a distinctive perspective. Uh, it's, it's also linked to this, uh, how to study theory by linking it to practices of global domination resistance, using that also, also using the framework of imperialism, colonialism, capitalism, racial capitalism to it. And again, a distinctive approach here is on understanding how many of these concepts travel across the, uh, across the world, how knowledge and concepts and theories travel, how they intersect with distinctive local practices and how these are uh, articulated differently in different times and spaces. The, Politics of the Middle East. Oh, sorry, we need to go back. Yeah, politics of the Middle East is again. It's a uh, the modules here. They balance historical and theoretical uh, works and rigor, and they also cover provide many up to the minute uh, re uh, analysis of regional and global developments. Given the very complex history of the region. You need to get the very strong grounding in the history in order to shed light, in order to uh, understand uh, ongoing events. So these modules uh, combine all these various uh, tasks and challenges. And many of the modules that are taught here, they cover some of the very contemporary themes, providing a historical grounding also, uh, themes such as politics of resistance, politics of religion, politics of solidarity, urban politics, infrastructure, migration, artificial intelligence and human security. Then we have MSc politics of Africa, where again, as in the politics of Middle East, uh, you learn about historical, uh, uh, historical debates, the, the history of the region, how many of these ideas I, uh, have, have uh, 
been applied to Africa. Also, the, learn about the contemporary institutions, evolution uh, in the post-colonial context, and the various debates uh, which are underway in the region and how these are informed by many of the key concepts in politics. So, uh, so again, the focus is on, like in Middle East, studying Africa from the perspective of many disciplinary concepts, as well as uh, focusing on the context, on the regional context and, and the highlighting the regional specificities. The final one, MSc Politics of Asia, which is a new offering from, uh, from this year. And the focus is on close analysis uh, on politics of Asia. We have two streams here, South Asia and East Asia. And there are a range of modules, options, which are available, which cover uh, Southeast Asia, Central Asia, other parts of Asia. And these modules also focus on questions such as how do globalization, nationalism, arms race, nuclear rivalry, urban development affect political life, politics of ethnicity, religious, religion, gender in the region. Also, how do we understand the specific characteristics of politics? formal as well as informal in different parts, different parts of Asia. So, so as I said, it's organized along two pathways, South Asia and East Asia. So, and, and you also study regions, uh, different regions of Asia from different uh, disciplinary perspective. This degree is, uh, is also very uh, popular with people who are interested in working with international organizations and uh, NGOs and, and also those who would like to pursue further uh, research oriented uh, uh, work. So now having uh, given you this uh, overview of our theory, let me hand over to uh, Felix uh, Berenskjöter to talk about to, to uh, give you a taste of his approach uh, and how international relations theories and concepts can uh, illuminate our understanding of the current state of politics connected with the pandemic. Over to you, Felix. Thanks, Bhavna. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Felix Behrensköter and I'm the head of department of politics and international studies. I also am an academic who, if I'm not a head of department, I also teach international relations. I uh, have been doing this for 10 years now at SOAS. Um, like my, many of my colleagues, I don't actually come from Britain. I come from uh, somewhere else. In my case, I'm from Germany. Originally, I studied in the US. Um, and I think one of the things you will find in our department is that we are an incredibly diverse uh, bunch of colleagues, um, just as diverse as our students. So what I want to do is just very briefly give you a, um, a taster of what I might teach you if you would come to source, me or some of my colleagues. Um, and I took as a theme here, the politics of security or insecurity, because the politics of the, of the pandemic um, really are in some sense um, preoccupied by thinking of the virus as a security threat. And I think this is really important for us to kind of understand and not just take for granted. Why is that? Um, how is how is a virus um, becoming a, a issue of security or insecurity? Now, to get there, I think what we need to understand is that um, threats and the question of security have always been contested. Um, so there is no uh, taken for granted understanding of what is what it means to be secure or insecure, even if we think um, that, uh, you know, there are some obvious dominant threats out there that we just know about. And so if you look at these images here, you know, we see um, a, a nuclear explosion um, of, a, of, a, of a nuclear weapon, you know, the, the famous mushroom cloud. We see, you know, the, the attacks on the um, Twin Towers in Manhattan in 2001. Um, we see, you know, the, a picture of a hacker. So the idea of a cybersecurity threat. We see a virus. Um, we see um, a, a boat uh, full of um, people coming across the ocean, um, 
you might think, well, these are just people on a boat ride, but usually these, these sort of pictures suggest that they are refugees. And in some, and in many cases, uh, refugees are actually considered to be um, threatening because they, for some reason, seem to um, be different from us. So often migration and refugee streams are cast in language of security or insecurity. Then you see a protest uh, movement uh, and you might think, well, why is a protest movement considered to be or talked about in terms of security? Well, it might well be because it endangers the stability of a regime and it challenges um, conventional ideas. And of course, we know about global warming. We know the poor ice bear on the, on the, um, on the, on the cap there that is just uh, uh, a symbol for climate change. So we have all these security discourses, all these images of threats um, around us. And I think we need to understand that they are not natural. They're just not given. Most obviously in the lower part, um, why, I, why is migration often talked about in terms of security or insecurity? Why are migrants sometimes considered to be threatening to a society? Why is protest sometimes considered to be a danger? And in what sense is climate change um, a threat to us and to whom exactly? And so you need to unpack these questions. You need to, un to, uh, need to ask who is actually uh, telling us what, the, what it means to be secure and insecure. Now, if we go to this um, phenomenon of the pandemic that all of us have been living with now for about a year, um, if you see these discourses, um, and these are more from the from the beginning of the pandemic, but you saw this about a year ago when when it's you know when it when it took hold in much of the world, a lot of leaders started to talk about the virus as an enemy that we are at war with. Yeah, and this is not something we should take for granted. We should ask why is this? Um, why is COVID nineteen understood to be a security problem? We know it's a health problem. Um, we also know that it affects the economy, so it has definitely an, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, an, an, an economic dimension. Um, you know, people cannot go to work. Um, it is difficult to earn money. It costs the state a lot of money to compensate for closed businesses and so forth. So we know the health dimension. We know the economic dimension. But why is it talked about as if we are at war? And this is not something that you hear once or twice. Yeah, many leaders have talked about. Uh, this notion, you know, Trump talked about, you know, him being a wartime president. Um, uh, Boris Johnson in the UK said we must act like a wartime government. Emmanuel Macron talked about, said we are at war, and we see the military being involved in testing. Um, we see the idea that uh, um, uh, those on the front line, the nurses and so forth, are treated like heroes or frontline workers, um, and uh, and even those uh, scientists, you know. Who, who kind of was researching for a vaccine or were, who were calling um, uh, or informing um, um, the public about the dangers of the virus were um, talked about in terms of, you know, doing a service uh, um, uh, as if in wartime, self-sacrificing themselves for the greater good and so forth. Now, why does that matter? Well, it matters because it, it puts us in a situation in which government can claim to have a special an extraordinary situation at its hand where it has to redirect resources to fight this enemy and where criticism or alternative approaches don't really have much of a space to be heard. So the problem here is that you can create an environment in which a health issue or an economic issue is turned into a security issue that closes down debate, that gives governments the power um, to act in certain ways because they consider it necessary and direct a lot of attention and resources to this particular undertaking. So what we need to do when we hear um, politicians, the media talking about something like a, a tiny virus, like an enemy and thinking like we are at war and it's something that must be defeated, which is of course not possible. We cannot defeat the virus. We need to live with the virus, right? Um, so we need to ask these critical questions. Yeah? And, and uh, as, a, as a student of, of politics, a student of international politics, you would ask these questions not only in a particular context, but you would ask these questions um, um, uh, from, from, from a global perspective. And you would ask, why is COVID-19 defined as a th security threat? A threat to whom and who defines it as such? And are, is there variation? Is the response in the United States the same as it is in China? 
Um, what about the different European responses? What about the perspective from India? How does it affect um, 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 countries and, and societies in sub-Saharan Africa? What are the consequences of, of framing the response as fighting a war for political debate, for decision-making, for behavior, for identities? What does it mean now that we have vaccine passports probably coming towards us? Does it mean that some people are safer than others? Is there going to be a discrimination in terms of age, gender, occupations? Um, how does the virus reframe the way we, we see each other um, as being in danger to society? And I think in the end, we need to ask what are alternative ways of framing and acting? Um, if you look at the previous slide, all of these are men. Is there something, is there a gender dimension to the fact how we talk about this virus, how the responses are being framed? Is it possible that female leaders of states have a different approach, talk about this differently, and maybe, maybe are more successful um, in, in tackling um, the pandemic. So this is just a very brief window into some critical questions that you would have to ask um, about even something seemingly obvious, such as how we deal with um, a pandemic. So, and with that, um, I'll hand over, and I think quite nicely, um, um, link up with my colleague, Hagar. Thank you, Felix. Hi, everyone. It's really weird to talk without seeing your faces um, to an empty screen. Um, I want to um, kind of follow Felix's lead and open another window in order to think about the pandemic, but maybe I'll say a few general words before that. Um, so I teach political theory at SOAS, um, which means I will be your course convener should you decide to take the MSc in political thought, um, but also our models are open to you if you take other degrees as well. There are already a question about this, which we're going to address in the Q&A, and I'm taking this opportunity to invite you yet again to post any question you have in the Q&A function. Um, now, as Bhavna said, like many other subjects, when we teach political theory at SOAS, we do it somewhat differently. And we do it somewhat differently, both by opening up to texts um, that go beyond the regular westernized or Western canon, but also in terms of being very committed to thinking about the world we inhabit and share. So whereas in many other places, political theory would be the intellectual space where we engage in abstract thinkings, in abstract ideas, at SOS, we try to tie these ideas very concretely um, to political histories, and specifically to histories of colonialism and imperialism and to the real world politic today. And of course, the two are very tightly related. In my tester today, as you can already see in the slide, I, I, I want to do this, even if very briefly, by thinking with you um, uh, uh, through Foucault on COVID. But I want to begin um, with um, marking much more generally what it means to think concretely about abstract ideas. So, the point from which we start the study of political theory at SOAS is, is that we can never talk in abstract um, about ideas such as, say, equality or democracy. Um, C.L.R. James argued that it was the wealth generated in the sugar plantations of the Caribbeans that allowed Europe and the US to start playing, experimenting with democratic ideas. And indeed, when we read um, in our classes, um, many of the, of the constitutive texts of democracy in the 17th and 18th century were being told repeatedly by their authors that self-rule requires time, that if people are to engage in the practices of democracy, they need some leisure. Without leisure, there would be no knowledge of the world, and without knowledge of the world, there would be no proper um, decision-making processes. But time is a function of wealth or at least of some um, um, material stability. Time arrives with the possibility to suspend labor. And this possibility was given to a growing British class um, precisely through um, the plantation economy, the sugar and the tobacco and the related slave trade. This is just to say very quickly that we cannot think about liberalism without thinking about the economy of sugar and slavery. Or to take a, a very quick another example, some of you may heard about Habermas in your A-levels or GCSEs. For him, essential to democracy is the idea of the public sphere, a sphere of debate, a sphere that is often imagined um, 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 in intellectual communities 
um, as a space in which people have the time to debate, have coffee, smoke cigarettes, and, and engage in public affairs. But where does the tobacco come from? Where is the coffee coming from? Um, th there is no political thought, I guess this is what I want to say. There is no political thought without post-colonial thought. And, and this is what we try to engage in, in SOAS. But as we said in the time I have, um, I, I do want to try to talk not about post-colonialism for a moment, uh, but about COVID and Foucault and, and to stay within the British context. So Foucault very basically told us that we are thinking of power in the wrong terms, or rather according to a wrong image. And this is the image of sovereignty that you have at the, at the top of this triangular. And what he tried to do is to develop two new ways of thinking about powers, two new ways of understanding powers, to, to argue that there are two other modalities um, according to which power operates, which is biopower and disciplinary power. I cannot elaborate much about any of those. Um, you have the slide here, but I want to try to get into your common sense um, through thinking about context. So Foucault tells us that disciplinary power emerges in the 17th century with the Black Plague and, and with the effort to manage the Black Plague. Um, and, and, and I hope you can understand it almost intuitively because when it emerges, it emerges basically as a form of a lockdown. Um, each family was confined to its house. There was a strict ban on household mixing, even though they did not call it this way. Um, there were practices of self-isolation, although they did not call it this way too. Um, there was a clear management of how people get their shoppings, et cetera, et cetera. So it was very much like what we experience. And, and Foucault describes it as a power that operates not through an ancient, through a person who um, oppresses you um, or making you do something, but through the very organization of space and of bodies in, in very defined allocated um, points in the space. And we can talk about it more if you'd like. Um, to engage as part of the Q&A also in an intellectual conversation. But if we look at the UK, we see that not all elements of the pandemic were treated in the same way. That is, um, not elements were treated through a rigid control of individual bodies, through controlling uh, mixing by making sure each one knows where their proper space is, right? Think of the idea of bubbles as, as precisely such mode of organization, social bubbles, I mean. There are elements of life, there still are elements of life, um, which, which have been continuing to operate along an almost opposite logic, a logic of circulation, of allowing the free movement of people and goods, um, leaving the airport open um, throughout most of the pandemic until very recently and to some extent also now, is, is probably the clearest example of, of all. Now, my time here is very limited and I'm not sure how much time more I have. Um, so I'll just say um, the one thing that I think is important um, and, and much Felix, rather than trying to answer the question, um, I will ask the question as, as a way of, of um, showing you what kind of questions we're asking. So a way of thinking critically about the government's approach may begin with mapping better what was being halted according to a disciplinary technology of confinement and what was subjected to a different logic, the logic to which Foucault calls biopower, the one you see at the, um, Bavna? okay, <laughs> biopower, the one you see at the, um, at the right bottom of, of the triangular there. Um, who and what, in other words, were allowed to move freely and where to? Which movements were secured, facilitated even, and which was, were halted? And I think once we engage in this mapping, we can start thinking um, 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 more accurately and more critically on the pandemic. Um, do I have like one more minute, you think? Okay, one. Um, I'll use half. So, so I'm not going to try to answer this, but I, I want to give you a hint of how to start approaching this question. Foucault tells us that biopower is the main technology of neoliberalism. This is a logic of governance that, unlike disciplinary power, or unlike the idea of the lockdown, if you will, does not believe that we can bring everything under control, that does not believe that we can completely eradicate ne negative effect. We rather need to minimize damages and maximize benefits. 
And so, so think about the idea of flattening the curve, right? It's not about stopping the disease, it's about flattening the curve. Or, or the idea of, of herd immunity that we had at the beginning is, is a perfect example of this. Why is it? Because the important thing here is to maximize circulation and above all the circulation of capital. The circulation of capital is the one thing that must not be hunted, halted. And, and if we engage together one day um, in, in one of the classes in this exercise of mapping, I think we can think critically about what is being promoted, um, but also the prices and what is being lost in this understanding of what's more important and what's less important. And I'll conclude with that and um, move to Bhavna to conclude our discussion. Thanks very much, Hagar, and also thanks, Felix, earlier. Uh, I'm not going to be making any presentation, but just uh, offer some of my thoughts uh, on uh, what my colleagues have talked about and on the concepts and debates uh, that they have introduced, the questions that they have asked. So uh, I will just talk about how I uh, address some of these themes in the module uh, that I teach. And this is uh, one of the uh, postgraduate modules that I teach is geopolitics and security in Central Asia and, and the, and the Caucasus, Caucasus. So broadly speaking, it's the, the region of Eurasia, China, Russia, Central Asia. There's also coverage of Iran and Middle East. So even the concept of uh, Eurasia as a very broad kind of an idea. A number of themes here uh, focus on China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is China uh, initiated globalization, globalizing China, and the uh, also China presenting, articulating this vision of a different kind of vision, which is not a liberal uh, uh, vision, uh, but it's a it's a it's a vision that uh, emphasizes infrastructural development, people to people connectivity, uh, investments in transport technology and, and, and trade and, and, and the uh, ties between the people. Again, it's uh, what is interesting here to look at is, and linking that with the previous debate about politics, uh, how the politics has changed during the pa uh, pandemic. How do we look at the current state of geopolitics now in the COVID stage from, from uh, last year when, uh, when COVID became uh, the, the global phenomenon? One thing what we find when we talk about the lockdowns and when we talk about this kind of the, the state imposing these various restrictions and close, uh, closing of boundaries and restrictions on movements and, and other things and, and also the, the stagnation in terms of production capacity. We look at this initiative of China and, and say, what does that mean? How do countries, how, how does a major rising power such as China with its globalizing vision uh, address these issues and, and also we, what we remember that COVID originated from China. So all this border closure and everything initially affected China. So, so we look at this paradox between these visions of connectivity, the, the increasing trade, promoting trade and transport and infrastructural linkages and the new forms of uh, closure which have and immobilities which have come into place. And we don't know how long lasting these are, uh, to what extent these might, some of these may also become fairly entrenched in the system. So that's uh, one of the things that we, we talk uh, about and, and reflect on the, the effects of this across the globe as well. So when we look at the geopolitics geopolit of the uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, I focus on the region of Eurasia, but there are implications for many other parts of the world. And many other questions have come uh, to the fore. So the, as the, some of the traditional geopolitical issues of the traditional notions of security and boundaries and state sovereignty, these concepts also need to be defined somewhat differently because in many ways, the addressing COVID requires a new way of cooperation, coordination between the various regional uh, powers, uh, countries in the various regions, and also global uh, ties. It also 
requires looking at the north-south issues from a new perspective. So there is also an obligation, for instance, about redistribution of vaccine, uh, making vaccine available at an affordable pace to various countries in the world. And here also we find that the countries in the region are engaged in both, in a sense, promoting uh, countries which have vaccines to sell, uh, the West, the US, sorry, but I, I mean the US, the UK, a number of other countries, and also Russia and China have their own vaccines, and many of these are also being now uh, produced in Russia, uh, uh, sorry, in, in India. So the distribution of these vaccines and, and the related to that is not just the power dynamics, the competition, also the soft power dynamics where countries are posing as helping uh, other countries. So China, the Belt and Road Initiative, very quickly China started labeling that as uh, the Central Asia component, the Silk Road Initiative, Silk Road Economic Belt. China began calling it as also the the health Silk Road. So we are seeing anyway, these ongoing uh, adaptations and, and emergence of new, uh, new patterns. I think in the interest of time, I will stop uh, because I know you will have uh, questions about the program, about my colleagues have said. So, uh, so please type up your questions. And as people are typing questions, let me just uh, read couple of questions. I've answered a couple of questions which were raised. Let me just read out one question by Iria Lopez. Uh, MSC International Politics and MSC Political Thought. Uh, it seems there's quite a bit of overlap between them, uh, between what's studied and career direction. So could you please clarify the difference? So maybe Hagar or Felix, do you want to say something? I'll take the second question. Um, about the difference between the MA International Studies and Diplomacy and the MSc International Politics. Um, while um, Hagar, I think, are you typing or do you want to answer? Um, I, I can answer. I was beginning to type, but maybe. It, it's okay, good. then go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so generally, maybe it's better to answer this way because it applies to other programs we have. Um, generally, we try to maximize options for students um, and to allow um, as much flexibility that does not then damage your, the course of your study, which ends up in sometimes having overlaps because we want to open and every model we can open to as many of you as possible. Um, but if you'd look at the structure and the core um, demands, you'd see quite a lot of a difference between MSc International Politics and MSc in Political Thought. Um, international Politics, and maybe Felix would add to this later, um, is, is in a way a widest um, 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 degree program. It offers the, the, the widest scope in thinking about um, questions of international politics. Whereas MSc Political Thought focuses on political theory, even though it is important for us to also include regional expertise if you'd like one. Um, so, so to allow you to do this um, and, and to allow you to think also beyond or, or in combination with theory. Um, so, so the structure is different the, the different, the core options are different, um, but in terms of choice, we, we try to have as much overlap as possible, just to make sure that you can all enjoy whatever interests you the most. Yeah, and to follow up from that, so the one question on what's the difference between um, the MSc in, in um, international politics and the A in international um, studies and diplomacy, which is offered through our Center for International Studies and Diplomacy. The, the simple answer is um, that the MSc International Politics is the more conceptual or theoretical or, or academic oriented. Um, so this doesn't mean that we don't engage practical issues. Of course we do, um, but the, the, MS, the MA International Studies and Diplomacy um, deliberately um, caters more towards those who want to and maybe come from a practitioner's uh, a perspective and a practitioner's career who want to work in international NGOs um, or who come from that sort of work and are interested in diplomacy, negotiation, diplomatic practice. Um, and, uh, you know, it has a study tour attached to the program where, well, not this year because of the pandemic, but usually where students go to Geneva or maybe to um, the United Nations in, in New York. 
Um, so that's the, the MA International Studies and Diplomacy. It is slightly more expensive, um, but you get something else for it. I, I would say that the, the MSc International Politics, I mean, you have both programs on the website. You look at the structures, you look at the modules, you see which ones uh, interest you more. Um, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, you would be happy with either of them. Um, so I, I think it is, it is more a question of whether you are keen um, to, to engage a bit more with the theoretical conceptual conversations and debates in international relations and the discipline, um, or whether you're more keen to think about the applied uh, angle, um, you know, to engage in and learn about uh, negotiation skills, uh, diplomatic practice and so forth. So I would say that is roughly the main distinction between those two degrees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Felix. Uh, the question, uh, again, about the uh, difference between MSc rather than MAs, uh, it's simply that the degree politics is part of the social sciences uh, stream, whereas uh, MA would be master of arts. So if you're doing languages, uh, arts, uh, uh, languages and cultures, you would get an MA, but in uh, politics, international relations, it's MSc. Um, there's also the question by Firuz on the thesis requirement for MSc in international politics and uh, what kind of research, write, what the research and writing process is like. So I will say a little bit to this and if uh, my colleagues want to add, you can add to it. Uh, you, uh, the dissertation is uh, also that counts as one, a separate uh, uh, so, uh, module. You select uh, the dissertation topic, uh, you finalize it in consultation with people who you have been working on. So you have plenty of choice. You'll be guided once you start your master's, you'll be guided through that process. And then sometime by end of February, you, fit, you settle, you decide what is the topic that you want to work on uh, and abstract. And again, we will guide you through that. A lot of times students decide a topic that they want to slightly change it. Uh, it that is all fine. You will have a supervisor uh, in uh, who will again guide you through that process. So you have number of sessions, number of hours of supervision with them, and you are also free to approach other colleagues in the department to talk and further clarify this topic. But the supervisor is the main person in charge. In the term uh, term three, there is uh, also a component where you do we uh, you do a literature review and there are some other set of readings which are relevant to uh, preparing for the dissertation and then you have to submit a 25 percent i think uh, of the mark which is based on the paper that does literature review and you will have a number of people in the department giving lectures on this and again talking about the methodology, talking about how to do literature review, how to conduct research, how to refine your uh, question. And then after in this, uh, in the rest of the summer, you work on your dissertation, you do the research, you have meetings with your supervisor and the dissertation is submitted in mid uh, September. And uh, that's basically, yeah, is what the process uh, is like. And just to follow up from that, um, taking on um, the, the next question by Anonymous. <laughs> It's in the, um, what are the future prospects after doing the MA in international politics or international studies? Um, is there a placement system? Um, in what areas are alumni of these programs working in? Um, I think there are, two, there are two points here. I think the first is that you do a degree, a master's degree that, that puts you on a very broad um, level of in terms of skills. So when you when you study international relations, you not only learn about, you know, conceptual, methodological, theoretical angles that make you see the world in particular ways. You learn how to analyze, how to critically engage with with literature, with political discourse. Um, you know, you learn how to write um, a dissertation. Um, you learn how to present. I mean, all these things you also learn in other. Uh, master's degree. So this is not just uh, unique to SOAS. These broad skills and capacities that you bring are attractive to a whole range of employees. So our alumni really go to, you know, from NGOs, so non-governmental organization, into government, into media, into, um, you know, even some go into business, uh, others go into finance, uh, others other may end up being a photographer. I mean, there is really no 
you know, fixed job description that comes out of um, a, a degree on, uh, in either international politics or in any of our regional um, um, degrees, you know, Middle East studies, of course, um, are also of great interest to, let's say, companies that look for risk analysts um, who want to understand, uh, you know, what is what, you know, what is the current political social situation in particular parts of the world? Can we go and invest there? How can we um, 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 uh, implement our, our, our programs, our peace building programs, maybe, you know, for the United Nations or the, the World Trade Organizations? Um, so basically, I think you, you need to see all these um, degrees as not only attractive in terms of general skills, but the actual um, expertise that a SOAS degree gives you makes you particularly attractive um, because SOAS has a very good reputation. And people know when they hire a SOAS graduate that they know, um, you know when, when, they, when they talk about a particular region of the world, they know what they're talking about because our academics do, we do, uh, we give you that sort of knowledge. Um, we don't just read about Africa, you know, our colleagues have, have lived there, they study there, they speak the language, they, they know the culture. So there's something about giving you a, a, an edge, I would say, over someone who does it at the LSE or King's College, if you take another London um, competitor. But I would also mention, by the way, that the London location is a huge advantage because, you know, it's not, I mean, SOAS doesn't have a placement system in the sense that we, we, we kind of give you an op options um, um, to, to, to work in um, or we have direct links. I mean, some of us as academics do have direct links to employers. Um, but really, I think the key is that London is a market is so incredibly rich in terms of job opportunities um, that it is very difficult to, to kind of uh, um, uh, ignore um, uh, that, 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 you know, you, you, if, if you do your PhD, uh, sorry, if you do your master's degree in a small town, you just don't have everything at your doorsteps. You just don't have all these connections, all these events where you can network, where you can meet people and, and, and where you can get a foot in the door. So that's a long answer to, I think, a very important question um, because the degrees are quite short. They're only one year. And in the end, you, you know, by, by May, June, you already want to know, well, what am I doing afterwards? And you apply for jobs. So that is an important question. We have a careers office as well, by the way. They help you thinking about that. They help you with the CV. They help you, um, you know, if you have a job talk and so forth. So uh, we prepare you for that. Maybe to um, continue from that and addressing two questions I thought I answered in the um, Q&A box, but I actually pressed the wrong button and it did not type my question. Um, one of them asked about people who arrived to us after actually taking a time off um, studies and having a career and coming to do an MSc. Um, we have quite a few people like that. Some of them have long careers in journalism, in NGOs, in diplomacy, and then they come to us and do MSc. I don't have the numbers. I just have an impression from what's going on in my own classrooms. Uh, maybe Felix, Felix will have the numbers. Um, but this also gives you an advantage because you share spaces with people who, who have real hand experience, not just us, but also your fellow students. Um, and another question was about languages. Um, so. I think in all, but at least in most of our degree programs, you have the opportunity of taking language. Um, and, and again, this gives you an edge. If you want to go and work in some region, um, you will have a, a, a source language um, qualification. Yeah, uh, thanks. There was, a, I think there's a, a question on the CRG, the Conflict Rights and Justice Program and the center. The uh, basic yes. answer is yes, you can attend. Uh, the, the center organizes various seminars which are open to public. So, um, some of, uh, so you are free to attend any of these lectures. There are also, depending on which particular program you're doing, you, uh, there are also modules in the, uh, the conflict rights and justice which may be available uh, for the program that you're doing. Uh, so the center isn't really a physical place where which has boundaries and where you know in only certain people are now allowed. It's an open forum that uh, for uh, different talks and ideas, and act many activities are available to all members of SOAS and and also people from outside. Yeah, I think actually that's a good like in general the the fact that our programs are. Um, you know, not only hosting the same department, but 
many of the modules actually um, are also hosted in other departments. So when you, when you come to SOA, SOA is not a big university, it's a quite small university, but it is big enough to give you a whole variety of, of options and choices. So you can actually take modules from other departments, from other disciplines. Um, so, you know, taking one um, particular degree or signing up for one particular degree doesn't mean that you're restricted only to that theme. Um, you really have a look at the program structures that we offer at the different options um, that, that are available to students, because the, again, not just in the politics department, but also across, you know, to law, to economics, to languages, to, so, to anthropology, to the arts. Um, often we, you, you can take modules in other departments um, as well. Um, and I see a final question about the, the politics of Asia uh, degree. Um, there's a question of which path students usually take. Um, I, I wouldn't say that there is a path that students usually take. The politics of Asia degree has two paths, as my colleague Bhavna pointed out, an East Asia and a South Asia um, path. But I think um, the important point here is, is that, you know, if you're interested in South Asia, that's what you should focus on. If you're interested in East Asia, that's what you should focus on. You shouldn't think about which one gets, gives me a better job opportunity, because if you do well and if you if you're interested in and if you convey a deep um, understanding of that region, you will get a job. Um, um, you know, whether you're an expert on South Asia, um, India, or whether it is um, China, uh, uh, East Asia, Japan. I mean, you know, these are all driving powers, emerging powers, important places. And um, yeah, so I, I wouldn't think too much about which one gets you a better job. I think you should do what you're interested in. Okay. Uh... Thank you. I think we are going to be disconnected very soon automatically, right? Because of, there is another meeting starting. On I think we have two more minutes. Oh, we yes. have <laughs> Okay. Uh, yes, the person, the question on if you have a degree in business or technology, uh, what are the additional requirements? Uh, I think for working, for, uh, for a politics degree, you, uh, we see, I mean, there are cases where you can, do what is known as a certificate course uh, in order to then be able to apply. But maybe you should write to me and I'll be able to explain this to you in greater detail than what I can right now uh, under this. But uh, depending on, uh, yeah. Uh, on your background. Yeah, I think I, I would say, look, if you're interested in a particular program, write to the program conveners. Yeah. yeah? write to those who run the programs who are also responsible for admissions because they will tell you whether your profile is suitable or not. We're quite open in terms of profiles. You do not have to have a social science undergraduate degree. Um, you have to demonstrate um, some knowledge in, a, in, in the area. But, you know, I mean, we have we had uh, professional musicians doing a master's degree in international politics. So it is not impossible for you to have an unconventional background. Um, I would suggest if you're interested in a, de in a degree program, contact our colleagues, their, their information is on the website um, and uh, they'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thanks very much. And any questions, just email us and we'll be happy to answer these. Thank you for your for coming here and for, uh, for and your interest. Have a good night, morning, uh, afternoon, wherever you are. Yes. <laughs>